All right, well, welcome everybody. I'll, I'll give everybody a second to get their audio fixed. And uh, if you could, unless you're a pan panelist, if you could mute your audio and um, we will get started. All right, perfect. All right, well, welcome everybody to a, a Wednesday afternoon, beautiful, uh, perfect day in Columbia, South Carolina, actually. Uh, I am Dr. Robin DiPietro and we are fortunate enough to have with us a panel of industry experts. And uh, myself and Dr. Charlie Partlow, who's yeah. also a professor in the School of Hotel, Restaurant and Tourism Management, are going to be talking with these industry experts uh, from the food and beverage side of things today and talk a little bit about where we've come since COVID-19 uh, uh, reared its ugly head in uh, early 2020 to where we are now. I mean, unbelievably, it's been about six months. Sometimes it feels like six days and other times it feels like six years uh, since 2020 started. So uh, welcome and I'd like to introduce uh, our four panelists for today. Uh, the first one is Kiki Cyrus, who is the uh, owner or co-owner of uh, Kiki's Chicken and Waffles. And she is with us today along with Ashley Lambert, who is uh, one of the co-owners uh, of Steel Hands Brewery and uh, Steel Hands is um, in Columbia. Uh, Christian Niemi, Niemi, Niemi uh, is here, who owns Bourbon, uh, The Black Rooster, uh, F2T Productions, and Honey River Catering, uh, who's here. And the last uh, panelist with us today is Douglas O'Flaherty, who's been a uh, friend of the college for years and works uh, with the South Carolina Restaurant and Lodging Association. And so welcome all of you uh, to our panel today. We look forward to hearing uh, your uh, advice, your input. And if anyone in the audience uh, out there has a question, please feel free to put it up on the chat, chat room. And what we'll do is throughout the hour today, uh, I'll try and um, ask questions or fill in uh, with questions as we can. But please feel free, put your questions in the chat room. I also want to, before I, I give this to Dr. Partlow, I also want to let you know about some upcoming forums. Uh, as you may or may not know, this is the uh, School of Hotel, Restaurant, and Tourism Management's fifth industry forum. Uh, we started them back in May of 2020, and uh, uh, hopefully um, we won't end them anytime soon, but hopefully COVID will end and we can maybe get on a different topic. Uh, but uh, anyways, we welcome you, and uh, I want to turn the um, microphone over to Dr. Partlow, who's going to talk to Douglas or ask Douglas a question for us. Yeah, thanks, Robin. Uh, Douglas, I'm going to start with you since uh, you have your finger on the pulse of the restaurant industry in South Carolina and, and you're aware of what's happening nationwide. Can you give us a brief update on the state of the restaurant industry in South Carolina and what type of legislative issues may be of most importance to restaurateurs, especially independent restaurateurs? Certainly, Dr. Barlow, and, and thank you again for having me and uh, serving on this panel. Uh, um, you know, one of the things that I will say is, you know, March, and, and I'll you know, echo what Robin said, is March kind of turned everyone's lives upside down, um, both on a personal and a professional side, and the restaurant industry is no different. You know, at the beginning of the, uh, of the beginning of the pandemic and COVID-19, restaurants across the, the state and across the nation were unfairly shut down, you know, and, and they're still taking a... Uh, financial hit. Uh, restaurants were told to shut their dining rooms, uh, uh, serve meals to go, as y'all are aware, curbside delivery, takeout, what have you. Um, some operators, this was everyday business. This is what they did every single day. They had to drive through, they had takeout, and, and they were affected certainly by the pandemic, but not affected in all ways. However, other restaurants uh, that did not have uh, those uh, models in place had to pivot their business model and had to change. Some chose to uh, close uh, because they could not pivot or didn't want to pivot or did not want to be able to contribute to the, to the uh, uh, spreading of the virus and wanted to do it for safety reasons. Um, others uh, really took a hard look as to how and the best way for their business to operate and to run. Um, with the restrictions, uh, was it uh, safer to stay closed or safer to open, open limited hours, open limited capacity, so on and so forth. And so the industry is just upside down. It's absolutely completely in turmoil. We have restaurants 
uh, that report to us that are doing 20 to 25 percent in sales of what they did year over year from last year and then we have other restaurants that are reporting 200 to 250 percent increase of what they were doing last year and so it is just a complete mix across the board ultimately though the restaurant industry as a whole is in dire straits um, and you know as as collectively as an industry as a whole as a pandemic continues restaurant owners have had to work in finding safe and sustainable ways uh, to keep serving food and keep serving their guests. You know, hospitality, and I kind of probably preaching to the choir with this group, but hospitality is in your culture, it's in your blood. You know, you were bitten by something long time ago and once hospitality is in there, you know, it's really hard to kind of change, change and pivot to, to not shake hands or not greet a customer or not to smile, you know, to cover up your face with a mask or something of that nature. But Hospitality has certainly had to pivot and change a little bit when it, it looks at, and that's part of probably some of our biggest challenges in the restaurant industry. And, and it's one of the unique things that our restaurant industry has done is we've had to constantly evolve. We've changed. If you take a look at the history of the restaurant industry, it has constantly evolved and it's constantly changing. And that's one of the things that COVID is doing and it's forcing us to change. It's forcing us to change and take a look at things differently. One of the opportunities that I'm pleased to announce today um, uh, that the governor has re removed the restrictions for restaurant occupancy last Friday. It's something that our office has been working with the governor's office since restrictions were put into place. You know, what measures do we take a look at allowing diners to come back? You know, what percentages do we allow dining rooms to open? How do we take a look at safe procedures? And where do we look at it? And, and the governor's office, although makes those decisions, uh, they rely to our office as far as some of the experts to try to help guide those decisions. And sometimes we push a little harder than what they want us to push. And sometimes we're not pushing quite as hard as they were hoping we would push. But nevertheless, by removing the 50% occupancy capacity limits has allowed the restaurants themselves to now be back in control. And that's really, really important for our industry to allow restaurant operators to be in control of their own destiny. Having, you know, the 50% the capacity lifted, um, it's uh, good news for some operators and bad for other operators. You know, it just kind of really depends. It's again, it goes back to our industry so diverse and so different. Some operators find it to be bad news because they want to operate on a lower capacity because they want it to be safer for their diners or safer for their, for their staff, safer for their owner, safer for everybody involved and it's just a little easier to say hey the governor won't let us open any farther than 50 percent so they can only have limited capacity by lifting that limited capacity now comes back to the restaurant owner they can still make those decisions but now they don't have anybody to blame and they can't really say hey the governor's restricted the capacity however what we're doing and working with our restaurants and our restaurant members is to be able to explain to them that this is a safety precaution and so it's a good thing that you're going to say, we made this decision not to go to 100%. We made this decision to limit our capacity. And at that time, take it step by step by allowing tables, you know, maybe insert one more table in the mix and then two next week and then another one. And pretty soon your customers are going to be back to where they need to be. The other side is, is it really depends on your clientele. And it really depends on the, on the restaurant's clientele. Some restaurants, their clientele, they don't care about social distancing. They don't care about masks. They don't want it. They don't need it. Those kinds of things. Now that restaurant operator's in control. Other restaurants or clientele want that. They want social distancing. They want masks. They want to see those kinds of things. And so it really does allow for the restaurant operators to be 100% in control. There's no right answer, unfortunately. I really wish there was a right answer. And I really wish I had a crystal ball to predict the future. But I don't. So we do the best that we can. Douglas, um, the, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Is South Carolina's restriction on uh, restaurant occupancy in line with what a lot of other states are doing, or is this kind of a, a new initiative? Well, it started, uh, Florida actually started by lifting the restrictions, and what we're finding um, is that these are a big, these lifting of these restrictions are becoming a little bit more political um, than where they are with the beginning of an election year, being four weeks away from a presidential election. Uh, significant Senate and House uh, uh, elections in place, and we're finding some of those to be political. If you start taking a look at the map as far as which states are allowing what occupancy, 
and then you start comparing those, whether it's a red state, traditionally a red state or traditionally a blue state, you'll start to see some pairing and some comparisons uh, um, from one state to the next. So we're not necessarily on the norm, but we are we were not the first. Okay. Anybody, um, I uh, will go ahead. Yeah, I will tell you that that you know one of the things that that is just disheartening for our for our association and for our industry is that the National Restaurant Association predicts that one in six restaurants will not survive through the end of the year uh, um, without some additional uh, federal assistance, whether that comes from the state federal government or whether that comes from the state government or what have you. That's one in six. Start thinking about that number for a second, one in six, and then start thinking about to the end of the year. It's October. We're in the last quarter of the year. So when we say to the end of the year, that's only three months. One in six restaurants are not going to make it. And they're not going to make it because either consumer confidence is not there. Operationally, they don't have the perfect mix to be able to get things in place. Their debt is way too high and they can't find themselves to outbury for where it was for the last six months that they were in business. And so we are working very, very hard and very diligently trying to get some kind of restaurant relief package passed. And so I don't know if y'all follow the news or you follow Twitter or what have you on the political side of things in Washington, D.C., but it's going back and forth. You know, uh, the House passed a bill last Friday for $2.2 trillion, which included $150 billion for the restaurant industry. That was passed by the House. It wasn't a perfect bill. It didn't have everything that everybody wanted into it, and it doesn't take care of everything, but it was something. And it was something that we need. Maybe we can reduce that from one in six to maybe one in 16 restaurants. Now might not survive. We can change that ratio a little bit better. And then we heard uh, that Donald Trump tweeted that there's not going to be any stimulus packages until after the election. We're also now hearing that he's backtracking on his statement. And he's saying, well, maybe there might be some PPP funds. There might be something available before uh, the elections. And so right now, just know that the folks that are in Washington representing the restaurant industry, either through the National Restaurant Association or the Independent Restaurant Coalition, they're all working hard and diligently for our industry. And fortunately, South Carolina is right in that mix and really helping a lot. We've got two powerful senators uh, that are in our state and we are in their ear every single day about we need help, we need assistance. And so that is one of the things that we're looking at. And I don't know if you watch the news very closely, but if you have, this past week alone, and it's only Wednesday, two restaurant chains have filed for bankruptcy. So big restaurant chains. And so we take a look at that and the big chains actually get the headlines because when you have a big chain that files for bankruptcy, it, it does make the headlines and it does make the news. But just imagine every time a big change files for bankruptcy, you can probably count about a hundred other independent restaurants that are in that same boat of having to file bankruptcy across the board. So every time you see one, there's another one. So our industry is really, really hurting at this point and really trying to go through there. You know, sales are coming back. They're better today than they were two months ago. They were better two months ago than they were six months ago. Mm -hmm. So sales are really coming back. And uh, I'll let the panel talk a little bit about them. They're truly the experts when it comes to that. They're the ones on the front lines. They're the ones actually bringing in and counting the cash registers every day. Uh, when doing that. So I'll, I'll definitely let the panels do that. And uh, um, one thing I do want to do and talk a little bit about uh, real quickly, I know I'm running out of time here, is that, you know, restaurants in our states are still, they're not allowed to sell alcohol after 11 p.m. And anytime that there are restrictions of, uh, for service that doesn't allow it, certain segments of our industry get hurt from that. And even though there are certain responsibilities and there's always going to be bad actors in there, the vast majority of the restaurants are responsible businesses and should be able to be treated fairly. You know, in addition to that, in addition to that our state's antiquated alcohol laws, Title 61, are in desperate need of modernization. Our association's working. We have a list of modernization things to put in place uh, for next year. It is going to be at the top of our legislative agenda. To take a look at Title 61, one of the things that we were not able to do because it's in the state statute and state regulation is restaurants couldn't offer cocktails to go. And cocktails to go to give you an idea if you've not heard of the, the concept, you know, there's about 35 states in the country that actually allow restaurants with on-premise 
liquor license to allow cocktails to go. And it's not a cocktail that you would get in your car like you're driving through Bojangles and picking up a glass of tea and drinking it down the road. It's not that kind of cocktail to go. It's more like you're coming and getting a meal from an independent operator, typically more of a upscale or a casual dining restaurant. And then a mixologist would mix a cocktail that would be a specialty cocktail in a sealed container that you would take home or you would go to a hotel or you would go to a park or you would go somewhere to enjoy your meal because it's safer to be able to pick up your meal to go. And then folks would be more apt to do that. And it's additional revenue for the restaurants. And so our antiquated laws don't allow that to happen. And then lastly, I don't want to leave everybody with a bleak outlook of the restaurant industry. I don't want to do that. I know I'm painting a very, very broad stroke when it comes to that. And I'm also talking a little bit about the bad things in our industry. I do want to say this about our industry, though, that our industry has and will always be vibrant, resilient, and one of the most rewarding careers that you'll ever have in your entire life. And I'll leave on that note. Okay. All right. Thanks, Douglas. Well, uh, you've opened up a pretty good uh, segue to uh, our panelists. And uh, the first question I wanted to discuss or get you uh, panelists to talk about was something that Douglas mentioned, and that is uh, how have you changed uh, your business model? Uh, what changes have you made in terms of delivery style, service styles, delivery, dining out, uh, menu changes, pricing? Uh, just think about that. Uh, and uh, Kiki, we're going to start with you. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about some of the changes, some of the operational changes you've uh, made recently? Um, so in um, our restaurant location, we have um, basically had all our staff wear masks um, back, back of the house and front of the house. Uh, we did add barriers to um, our tuna arch location, whereas, you know, that shield to uh, protect our staff. But then we removed it because it just got to be too much um with you know handing guests their food and um, exchanging cash um we've added um hand sanitizer uh setups all over the uh, restaurant um we've um we have a large on the weekends we have large people waiting we have a lot of people waiting in the waiting room so we've changed that to have them wait outside and then we text them to let them know when their table is ready um, and we also have uh, social distance our tables um, with the governor announcing on Friday that, um, you know, we can do 100% 100, uh, 100 occupancy. Um, we've still kept our um, business at 50% occupancy because it's just better for us um, with the spacing wise in our restaurant. We have booths in one, so it's kind of hard for us to move tables around. Um, and then, you know, it's kind of harder for us because um, guests, they he they hear one thing on the news and they run with it, and it's like, no, he said 100%, but we still have to social distance. So uh, we had one guest on Friday say, well, no, the governor said this, so you, you can see our whole party attend together, and then we're like, you know, no, that's not necessarily true. So um, you know, it's 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 kind of tough for um, restaurant owners, and um, um, we've just you know put our foot down and just made sure that we are just, you know, following, following the policies and procedures that's put in place for restaurants. So. Okay. Okay. Uh, Ashley, let me kick that question off to you. Same, same question. Sure. Thanks, Charles. Um, well, you know, we took extraordinary measures to really prepare for the shutdown since, since day one and, um, and a COVID ready reopening, keeping the health and safety of our, our guests and our staff being our highest priority. We, we knew since day one, we wanted to remain active for our community and still be able to access them, whether our doors aren't open, but you know, our windows are up. So um, we had to create a new set of operations through a number of phases. For us, it started with our to-go beer sales only. Um, from there, we were able to open up outdoors only, and then, of course, indoors at 50%, which obviously was changed this Friday. But we used a lot of that downtime to really strategize with our team and make sure that we were ready to roll when they basically announced, yes, you can reopen. Um, but the to-go beer sales, honestly, were more of a positive impact on us. Yes, we had to shut down our tap room, but 
we did a lot of to-go beer sales by changing our pricing structure and basically um, offering a to-go beer special. Uh, if you've been to Steel Hands, you know you can get a, a case of beer to go, but we were offering buy three six packs, get one for free. So that's something that came out of this and we really saw an uptick for that. Um, whereas if we had shut down, we wouldn't have had that opportunity to still stay connected with the community and also produce sales. Um, another positive that came out of this is really our back of house, our distribution component. It's almost like we're running two different businesses. We have our front of house, which is our tap room, um, that's open to the public. And then we have our back of house, which is our distribution, where we send all of our product out across the state of South Carolina. So for us, you know, everybody was going to the grocery stores, they were going to the convenience stores, they were picking up stuff to take home, and they were filling their fridge with whatever they could. I mean, we all were doing it. But for us, we saw an uptick in sales. So our distribution actually increased our back of house sales. So that's something that came positive out of it for us. So we put a lot more focus in off-premise than we did on-premise. Um, and we have sales managers that, that work on that. But that was something that was a shift for us as our business model um, continued to pivot um, there. And actually out of that, we ended up being able to create a better communication platform with you know, the Publix, the Harris Teeters, the Total Wines are, you know, we created a master spreadsheet of all those contacts. So now we're actually better communicating with those people than we were beforehand. Um, so just a few things that came out of that. But as far as, you know, our operations front of house, we expanded our outdoor beer garden. So now we have two beer gardens. So we um, increased our outdoor seating. Um, obviously more people wanted to sit outside when they could. Um, we basically upholstered our outdoor picnic tables, if you can believe it, um, with boat grade vinyl that's held up very well um, and it created a wipeable surface for us outdoors. Um, we also created a, new, a limited menu for our food that was actually based out of necessity. I mean, there were shortages happening on our end that our suppliers weren't able to get us beef at the prices that we had originally um, you know, negotiated. So for us, out of necessity, we did kind of lower down our menu once we opened up um, outdoor and indoor. Um, we served everything in to-go boxes. That was really important to us. Obviously, there's um, some logistics from getting the food from our kitchen to the outside. So we totally changed that service as well. Um, all, we served everything in glass. So, I mean, there's just so many things to think about, but we started um, basically ordered plastic cups that were one-use cups. Um, they were biodegradable. So that was something we were able to offer um, you know, our patrons too. All of our food ordering moved outdoors. Um, you know, we installed an outdoor washing station. We did all kinds of stuff, you know, all the signage that was necessary. Um, you know, we just, we had to make a change in order for our customers to feel comfortable to walk in the doors or just enjoy outside or just have a sip of beer with us. Um, but really, you know, out of all this, we did see a lot of positive come as well as far as sales go. Um, you know, and we were able to basically capture, I think, a larger audience than we would have at this point in time because maybe other places weren't open and we remained active. So they wanted to go somewhere and obviously our site plan lends itself to a larger crowd and um, a larger crowd that can social distance safely and out in the outdoor areas and still kind of just, you know, enjoy life. So we, we were set up very well for this scenario. But, um, you know, our story really ended up being a positive one, so. Good, thank you. And Christian, for you, you've got several businesses that you uh, own and partner with. Uh, can you just give us some highlights on some of your operational changes? Highlights? Yeah. <laughs> highlights, oh, <laughs> let's see. Closed for six months, 2.5 to two to $3 million loss in sales. Um, yeah, we're in, we're independent. We're in a small independent restaurant with uh, with a local menu, and we don't we aren't the kind of place where you get food to go. So we had to pivot into that realm for a short while, only to find that it really doesn't suit us or our restaurant um, to do so. Uh, especially when we were confronted with the fact that you know uh, the government was giving six hundred dollars a week to employees to stay home, which I thought was fantastic because it, it kept everybody safe. Um, every time we've opened stuff up and infection numbers have gone up, uh, 
I, it's now we're now at a point where with the 100 percent, like Doug said, I, what I like about the the 100 percent, while I I I we have the same problems that Kiki is having with customers, but it does put the ball back into our hands after it was wrenched away from us. Um, and basically in some sort of nanny state sort of situation where they just didn't think we could do um, anything, took it away from us. And then uh, now, now it's back in our field and we can do what we, what we do best. Um, and yeah, and Kiki, I, I feel for you girl. Cause trust me, we, we dealt with the same crap this weekend, Friday night, suddenly people start rolling in and they just see tables open and they're like, well, we could sit there. <laughs> so, um, highlights, I can't say there are any highlights. I, I, I would be, I'd, I'd be sugarcoating a, a, a giant turd cake. If I said there were highlights to, to all of this. Uh, what I would like to have seen on this panel would have been a politician to explain to us why a, a pandemic that's been going on since March uh, requires them going into the next session before they do anything about it. Uh, to explain to us why uh, the, the Department of Revenue is still going after restaurants that have had no income, like, like rabid dogs. Uh, why uh, alcohol licensing could not, uh, why they couldn't just ride on the alcohol license they had until they, until they, why those payments couldn't be deferred. Those are the things that are gonna kill that one in six restaurants, like Doug said. These places are running out of money. I know these people. I've been friends with these people for years and they don't think, they do not think they're gonna make it to the end of the year. Um, we're at that point in the year where a lot of a lot of restaurants are coming up to that point where they're going to have to uh, make that big payment for their alcohol licenses. But you know, thank God. I mean, it, if it wasn't for Doug and and his people getting this stuff in front of these legislators, um, this would be be an even worse situation. And I mean, and and I know he's we talk, um, we text each other, you know, quite often. And I, and I understand, he understands our frustration and I understand his, uh, you know, he's, we're all at the whim of, of legislators who don't own restaurants. The majority of them are lawyers and have law firms, which never shut down during this entire pandemic, or they have farms that didn't shut down or whatever they have. None. Of, I don't know any of them that are restaurateurs. Uh, and unfortunately the, the, the biggest lobbyists I think in our industry seem to be the chains uh, that have shown these increases of, you know, or seeing that their sales are bigger than they were last year. Independence, we don't have that voice. It was only at the beginning of this pandemic that the uh, Independent Restaurant Coalition came together uh, with Tom Colicchio and some big name restaurateurs up in New York and other big cities. But it's a little too, it's kind of too little too late um, in a way because they, they threw it together and started lobbying for us. But, um, you know, when they feel like they can just go home and wait until the next session to deal with this, we're, we're, it's going to be a, a, a road of, of broken dreams and, and closed restaurants. So I don't ha I'm not Mr. Happy about this. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not all sunshine and rainbows about this. A lot of restaurants are still in a deep, deep, dark place. And it's going to take a while. And it's going to take our state to step forward and do something, which just reopening everything was not really enough. Um, the city of Columbia did a great job at the beginning. They had the grants. Um, the Richland County came out with some grants. That was all fantastic. That, I mean, at the beginning before the idle and uh, PPP money was able to come through, uh, those were the, some of the things that kept a lot of these places going. Um, so it doesn't look like it's gonna end anytime soon. So, Christian, I've been, to, I've been to your bourbon restaurant a couple of times. I really liked it. I haven't been to Black Rooster. Uh, my wife wants me to try that. Uh, are those businesses now open? Uh, yeah, we operation. Yeah, so we opened on September 9th to the 50% capacity. Um, and we are running with a skeleton crew. We have meticulously mapped out every cent of the PPP and EIDL loans that we got uh, in order to 
make it until the end of the year or at least until another package comes around or if we uh, can get back up to speed and not require any of that. Um, right now, I kind of feel like if we continue on the path we're on, we won't require any more uh, assistance um, from the government, um, which we're happy about. But I mean, it basically made, you know, myself and my partner, you know, we haven't taken a paycheck since March. Um, so it's been rough. Uh, but yeah, I think we're, I think we're moving toward in the right direction. I, I'm hoping that we don't, I'm hoping that the prognostications of, of a cold, dark winter with uh, not only the, the pandemic coming back in even more uh, viciously uh, along with the flu season, I hope that doesn't come to pass. I, I mm -hmm. hope all these professionals, <laughs> epidemiologists are, are just wrong this time. Uh, you mentioned some, you've gotten some pushback from customers on um, some of the COVID protocols. I think you mentioned that, and Kiki, I think you mentioned that too. How have you guys, how uh, prevalent has that been and how have you guys handled that? Well, Friday night was better than Saturday night. Saturday night just kind of when all the jerks came out. Um, and uh, yeah, you just, now you, now I have to basically have one of my top managers at the door constantly to watch for these people and uh, make sure they just don't blow past our hosts and go seat themselves or go up to the rooftop bar or, you know, things like that. So it's just explaining to them again. I think the governor did all of us a very a, a disservice by not saying something about that in his press conference and saying that although this is a hundred percent, you know, please be aware that you know restaurants have the right to continue because to continue to follow these protocols. Uh, the, uh, because the other thing was is that you know as of Thursday I was running with the skeleton crew if anybody expected me to go to 100% on Friday, there, there was, that was impossible. I don't, I would, I'm gonna have to, I'm, I'm in the process of hiring more people just so we can, um, you know, have at least a couple more people to add a few more seats. And that's, at this point, that's all we did. Basically, Black Rooster added one, one table, um, a six top that we have in the corner, which we were able to, get within, you know, out a little bit outside of five feet away from the, the closest tables. And at Bourbon, we were able to add two booths since they're high back booths back to back. But that's it. That's all we did. Um, so it's, it's baby steps forward. Okay. Um, Robin, do we have any uh, questions coming in from the audience? Yeah, Charlie, we got lots of questions coming in. I think we're going to be here all night. So <laughs> pour yourself a beer. And let's get going. <laughs> all right. Good. So here's here's what we have. So this uh, goes out really to all of you on the panel. Um, one of the things that we noticed uh, towards the beginning of this pandemic was a lot of customers were going out and buying gift certificates. They said, look, we don't want to lose our independent restaurants. So we want to buy our gift certificates. So are you seeing that um, purchase of gift certificates? Or um, do you plan on increasing, I'm assuming many of you, uh, are planning on increasing costs, uh, uh, I mean, increasing your menu prices to reflect the higher cost and the um, uh, struggles that you've been under. Where, where are you all at with that? Kiki, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, so for us, uh, it's kind of hard for us to increase pricing, you know, with our crowd, you know, everybody's like, uh, you, you know, during this time, why do you want to increase pricing? So I don't think you know, we're going to increase pricing as of yet. Um, I know some restaurants did have that, um, I guess, their tax that they were adding for to-go products because they were using predominantly all, you know, plastic items or whatever. But we didn't do that. We didn't go that route. Um, we're just going to just hope for more business. And, um, you know, we did have an increase in business this weekend. Um, and we just pretty much just put our foot down and just, you know, made sure we had a manager at the door to make sure people were coming in with masks. They're still coming in without masks. And I'm like, every place in Columbia, in South Carolina, you have to wear a mask. And, you know, we just had to put our foot down and just make sure that they are, um, you know, following our guidelines. Um, but, yeah. 
<laughs> we, uh, as soon as we closed on March 14th or 15th, we immediately removed our gift certificate link from our website. Mm. Um, it's, uh, gift certificates are only a temporary asset, but they actually go in your life, in your, uh, li they're more of a liability to you. So if you, what we worried about was, uh, if we got to a point, if, if the pandemic went on forever and we sold thir you know, $20,000 worth of gift certificates, what happens if we, if we don't make it and we close, mm -hmm. you know, you've got 20, you've got people out there with $20,000 worth of gift cards that can't use them anywhere. And then the other problem would be you sell all those gift cards up front. You, you front load like that. When you do reopen, if everybody rushes in and uses gift cards, you're not making any money. You're still paying all of your expenses. You're paying for food costs and everything like that. But all that money that you got that helped keep the lights on through the summer and uh, is gone. And now you're, you're really behind the eight ball. So we, we have yet to uh, reinstate our gift card sales on our website. We'll probably be doing that this week, uh, but we're not, we're not pushing it until we know we're, we're in the clear. Okay, thanks. How about you, Ashley? Yeah, I mean, we saw a small increase in gift cards. People obviously wanted to support us from um, a community standpoint, but mm -hmm. yeah, we saw that happened that we didn't expect was um, basically patrons were coming and paying it forward. So mm -hmm. they were actually um, purchasing cases of beer, paying it forward and say, keep this for when, you know, uh, you know, a veteran or a healthcare or worker or someone on the front lines came by, then we would give that beer that's being paid forward. So that nice. just kept cycling and that was just so cool to see. Okay, that's very cool. Uh, one more question um, that I have here on uh, the chat is um, from uh, a student and is wondering about the farm to table um, uh, issue. Has the pandemic had a toll on local farmers um, and you know is that going to be recoverable um, Christian maybe you would you can speak to this yeah so we we work very closely with a lot of farmers uh, for both restaurants farm and farm to table productions and uh, Honey River Catering so all of our entities uh, deal with a lot of local farmers uh, what we found was uh, yes many of them um, Many of them suffered a little bit from the uh, all the restaurants being closed this summer, but I'm I'll, I'll be honest with a lot of the small farmers that we deal with, it was actually beneficial to them in one way in that they had to kind of become a little more uh, they had to get a lot better at the marketing. Okay. And they had to find some other uh, avenues to to move their product, and they all did. The ones we work with all did a phenomenal job of that by starting CSAs that have become really popular. I mean, you know, for us, a lot of our farmers, um, especially starting farmers and such, we try to push them as much as we can into a into a retail role where they are selling at markets and stuff like that because they'll get better money for their product. Mm -hmm. uh, with really not a lot of labor, uh, selling to the restaurants, you know, they, they'll cut a deal because we're, they're selling larger portions. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll take 20 pounds of this, 50 pounds of that, depending on. So over the summer, they were able to, a lot of them did pivot to, uh, I noticed their Facebook pages got better. They were on Instagram. They were at different markets moving their wares. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it bodes very well for them. Maybe not so much for me next summer when they realize that they have a better chance of selling, you know, making more money doing those sort of things. Right. But that's, I, I would rather see them succeed than, than for us to, uh, you know, so it just, it, it, it works, it's worked really well. And I don't know of any, there are none of our farmers who, you know, had to destroy crops or lose crops or anything like that. None of the people that we work with directly ha had any of that sort of thing happen so awesome that was that was good good all right charlie take it away okay uh next question uh i'm going to ask you all to kind of look into the crystal ball and assume that um the pandemic flattens uh what operational changes have you made that you think you will keep or stay with 
uh, if and when the, the pandemic flattens. And I'm going to go in the middle group and start with Ashley first, then I'll go to Kiki, and then I'll go back to uh, Christian. So Ashley, let's start with you first. Sure. I mean, just a, a few small things. Like I said, the pricing on the cases, I think people have really gotten used to that. So we don't we don't feel like we should take that away from them. Um, so that's been very popular for us. So we're going to keep that in play. Um, the cleaning practices, I think that's that's something that we definitely want to keep as well. It just doesn't make any sense to go backwards on that. Um, we actually have remained open Tuesday through Wednesday. Obviously, we were doing to-go beer and people kind of got used to coming and getting to-go beer. So a part of our you know opening strategy was to keep Tuesdays and Wednesdays active. So we've kept a, what we call pints on the patio still available. People can come up and enjoy our outdoor areas um, and get a pint on the patio, have a few options for food um, and, and or get beer to go. So we're definitely gonna keep that for now. Um, that's still been successful for us and we're able to, to open in a limited capacity. Um, we'll keep our live music running Thursday through Sunday. That's something that we saw a shift in, um, adding a couple more days for live music so people can enjoy the outdoors. Um, since they're not able to go to, you know, big concerts around town. Um, but yeah, no, those are just kind of a few things that, that we'll keep in motion um, and just kind of take it from there. Okay. Kiki, what about uh, any changes you've made that you think will uh, stay in place? Um, for sure. Just like Ashley said, the cleaning practices, those the most important, you know, people want to see you cleaning. They want to see you wiping down tables and chairs and um, we actually bought um, a machine off of Amazon to sanitize the location at night um, after closing. So we're going to continue to do that um, and wearing the mask, um, of course, um, and um, pretty much just, just doing what we're doing now and uh, social distancing. I know I saw a question if, if we are still social distancing, being that um, at Master um, increased to 100%. And yes, we're still social distancing. Um, the way our restaurants are set up is so hard for us to add more tables without social distancing. So pretty much, we're really going to keep our tables pretty much the same. Were they all four tops mostly and booths? All four tops. Um, our Bower Parkway location, we actually do have seating outdoors. So we're utilizing that now. So during the pandemic, we had to actually purchase outdoor equipment out there because we didn't have any out there because we literally just opened that location last year in July. So knowing when we started getting busy, it was kind of cold out. So no one really was going to sit out there anyway. But um, during the pandemic, we, we had to rush and buy outdoor equipment and stuff so like that. Does your menu work well for takeout? Yes. Um, during the pandemic, we had a, a tremendous amount of people come in um, to order to go. So we did not see any drops in, in sales with to-go orders at all. Um, you know, with the soul food, everyone wants, you know, soul foods to, you know, take home. Um, Bow Parkway, we did close for uh, about two or three months because the business over there just closed the movie theater really drives our business and you know with that being closed and right now they're open but it's not the way how, how it used to be so we're just pretty much um, our business is coming from our marketing and word of mouth pretty much okay. and Christian your businesses haven't been open long but uh, what can you say about uh, your restaurants uh, well, we're definitely, we definitely fully pivoted, uh, over to delivery and takeout. Um, we've, uh, we've changed the menu a bit in certain ways. So, so that those products are, um, up to our standard if they were to be taken out or delivered. Uh, we're still working, um, pretty hard on, the containers. Uh, so we've, we've every week we've got uh, samples coming from different companies because we're just we're trying to get that right because uh, as as Kiki and, and Ashley probably I mean everybody knows like the cost for those goods are uh, are are really high if you need if you want high quality stuff that's not going to leak is going to retain heat is going to be reheatable uh, is recyclable or uh, compostable. So all those things are really expensive and 
you it's that do you want cheap or do you want good or you know so finding that balance is 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 difficult so we're still working on that but we are on uh, multiple platforms now for delivery um yeah well i mean it's the like like ash said the the, the cleaning is a no-brainer thing we'll continue with that um uh, we don't plan on we do, we do not plan on uh, lowering our social distancing uh, much until we start to see numbers going down. And right now that's not happening. So we'll continue on the same course we're on. We're fortunate at Black Rooster that we have the rooftop bar area and we have a lot of outdoor seating space. So we've added some more tables there and uh, are, you know, crossing our fingers for a continue, you know, for continued good weather. Uh, last year, everyone seems to forget this, but last year in October, it got cold, dark, and wet really early in the year. And that destroyed outdoor seating for us. Uh, the rooftop was just went from being one of the most happening places in town to absolutely empty uh, in the course of less than a week. And so we're, we're just kind of, uh, hoping that that does not happen again and we can ride this uh, beautiful weather a little bit deeper into the year uh, in order to uh, bank enough money to make it through those uh, cold months when we lose outdoor seating and have to reassess what we're gonna do with uh, whether we go up to a little bit higher seating capacity uh, will we'll depend really on how this uh, infection plays out. Okay. Robin, uh, any questions that you have? Yeah, I have a question about uh, employees and protocols when they come in. So I just wondered for the, uh, the uh, panelists, if do they um, just ask employees not to come in if they're sick? Do they take temperatures as they arrive at work? And then if uh, the situation would occur where you'd have a, an instance of an employee with COVID, what is the process that you would use in uh, continuing to maintain operations? Well, we've, so we have not had anybody test positive. Uh, we did in the summer when we were about to reopen, we were going to reopen to uh, 50% capacity in June of uh, like towards the end of June. And literally an hour after we got done with our reopening meeting, uh, we got a uh, word from one of our employees that they had tested positive. Mm -hmm. And at that point was when we, we made the decision to just sh sh shut everything down again. Mm -hmm. And um, since then we haven't, we have put in, we have followed everything that CDC and DHEC have uh, recommended. So we take temperatures when our employees arrive, uh, that whatever manager on duty happens to be at the restaurant asks them the questions of whether they've been in contact with anybody with COVID, if they know, if they're feeling well, they ask them those questions. Unfortunately, we're in a situation where, uh, you know, that we have no legal protection. Um, and I understand both sides of that argument, so we won't get into it, but uh, we're trying, you know, we do the, we're doing everything we possibly can. So they have to, they have to wear their masks the entire time they're in, at work. Um, the, uh, the managers in, in, uh, on duty at that time are all calling out for hand washings at random times. Yeah. And yeah, and, and everything is just being uh, constantly uh, cleaned. So if we do have somebody, our protocol is to uh, immediately send them home and uh, work with work very closely with them uh, over phone to find out to do some contact tracing. Sure. So we had somebody that had a false positive the other day, and so we it was a good test for us. We had to scramble and do that, um, and we had them we had them go for two more tests um, because they said they were feeling fine and they. They did. They hadn't been around anybody. That was the the strange thing about it was that it was one of our uh, veterans who basically has quarantined himself through the entire the entire thing, and so he hasn't been around anybody. So we got scared that perhaps it was at the restaurant, 
that someone else had it. No one, so everybody got tested at one of the quick places. We had everybody's results back within about six hours. Nice. Um, and so as soon as everybody tested negative, we sent him back for a, another test and he tested negative. And then we sent him for one more just to be sure. And sure enough, he tested negative. So we were fortunate in that. Nice. How about you, Kiki? Um, for us, we haven't had anyone since we opened up for dining to have COVID. Um, but before dining, we did have one person who came in contact with someone who had it. Um, so basically, we just had to make them get the test taken and show us the results just so that we know that, you know, they didn't have it or whatever. Sure. Um, so um, we check temperatures of our staff when they come in each morning. Um, and that's pretty much it. So we just, you know, it, it's so hard because, you know, with the restaurant field, everyone hangs out with each other. And so when they leave work, it's like you don't know what they're going to do or who they're going to hang out with. So it's, it's tough because, you know, you don't have a large staff right now because, you know, uh -huh. you didn't have a lot of people that came, came back to work for you. Um, so we pretty much um, have our meetings and make sure, you know, we tell them, you know, make sure you wear your mask outside the restaurant and, you know, wherever you go. Um, also, I do see someone ask about the QR code um, with the scanning of the QR code. Mm -hmm. We actually add that, added that to our practices as well. So we don't have oh, any nice. menus at all. Okay. And we've, um, it's been pretty good, but the only thing is we have been getting pushback from some people who they feel that it's too uh, tech savvy. I'm like, uh, that's not tech savvy, but, um, <laughs> but we do have, um, printed to go menus for our older crowd, you know, okay. who don't, you know, have cell phones or, you sure. know, um, the, you know, iPhones or Androids or whatever. So we do have those, but the QR codes are the best thing ever because you don't have the menus and people passing it around, sure. um, you know, to pass uh, germs or whatever. So, okay, yeah, that's what we're doing. Great. Thank you. How about you, Ashley? Um, yeah, so basically we were following all the recommended procedures from the CDC and DHEC when it came to those situations, um, but we kind of took it a step further. We were able to actually hire a private doctor's practice that would travel to us on a weekly basis and basically <coughs> all of our employees on site for us. Um, so that was happening on a weekly basis and, you know, we would get the results back in a matter of two days prior to when we opened, which allowed us to you know, if you, if you tested positive or you were showing signs of sickness, so you weren't able to come to work. Um, That's great. That was, that we took it just another fold um, deeper, but that worked out in our favor a good bit. Um, but beyond that, obviously temperatures were taken before every shift. Um, masks are still being required and, and were at the time. Um, the protocol for us was obviously it was mandatory to, um, to take that test. And if you did test positive, you were sent home or if, you were feeling sick or showed any sign of sickness, you were obviously sent home and we, we traced accordingly, but we've been pretty lucky with, with our results. And, um, you know, our, our employees wanted to come to work. I mean, they love coming to work here and we wanted to make it a safe and friendly place for them. Nice. Perfect. I think Charlie, we have time for you to ask your one last question. question. We got about five minutes left. Yeah. Okay. So one more question, if you could go back and make any changes, do anything differently, what would that be? And uh, Kiki, we'll start with you. Um, are you talking about during the COVID or? Well, just from the very beginning, uh, when it came out, your business has got back up and running. Is there anything that you think, wow, I probably should have done this sooner. Or I probably shouldn't have had, probably shouldn't have done that. Any of those moments? Um. Um, I wouldn't say I, I don't, I don't think I have any. Um, the biggest thing is just probably having that one person at the front at all times, um, making sure that customers are coming in with masks because the mask was the biggest thing. Um, I think it was before the governor actually mandated for the whole state that's when we had a lot of trouble. Um, I think City of Columbia was first. And our bar parkway, we had it really rough because people didn't want to wear their masks. And even though we had it posted, even though we said it, 
it was like, ah, oh, you, you, you can't make me, basically. So I, I think just having um, someone there manager-wise saying, you know, this is what it is and, you know, you have to wear it or you have to leave type thing. Um, but other than that, that we, I wouldn't have any other changes. Christian, what about you? Um, I would just say that uh, larger cast reserves – um larger cash reserves uh is probably at the top of our list right now for what we plan to uh just constantly have on hand we were fortunate i've got friends in both taipei taiwan and hong kong um i was in taipei i was in taipei last year um working with a couple places over there and so i made some friends and they alerted me to what was happening over there way before it was even being talked about here. So we were able to, uh, as early as January, start uh, a cash piling um, protocol. Uh, we got rid of all extra excess expenses, cut down on hours, um, cut down on, at Bourbon, cut down on, you know, expensive uh you know, whiskey purchases, just really tried to stockpile as much cash as possible so that if we did have to close, we would have enough to make uh, it through. And so we were fortunate that we were, we, we were able to stash away enough to be able to last until about August. Um, and immediately, uh, I think we did. I think we did everything right that we possibly could, at, 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 as far as that went. So, if I could go back again, I, I just would have started. I just would have started earlier, and I would have, I would have made uh, made some different, a couple just different decisions financially, just to make sure there was a lot bigger war chest uh, waiting. So that's I think uh, the most important change. Yeah, very good, Ashley. Sure. So I think from a business standpoint, and since we were able to receive our funds early on from the government, I think if we had known that time frame to use those funds was to be extended, we might have mapped out that usage a little bit differently, only so that it stretched um, a little bit further. We felt like we were at such a fast pace to use that money that when we found out we could use it for a longer time, we felt like we might have used it differently. Um, that was one piece. Um, I think we also probably would have considered renegotiating larger volumes of cans. Basically for us, you know, there's a real can shortage out there and for us to not be able to have cans to put our product in to sell to market is, is a problem. Um, so for us, I think we would have done that um, a little bit differently and stockpiled as well. Um, you know, because we just put in an order for, you know, tropical IPA cans that we had to make a down payment on of thousand dollars we won't even get it till December I mean it's things like that that we're dealing with so that's you know a high pressure situation for us but um, you know on front of house side I think we would have ordered every outdoor table that's available because everything is back ordered right now um, you know the umbrellas everybody was living outdoors so that was something that we found to be you know, a little bit of a conflict not a huge deal but just something that we would have stockpiled as well so okay great uh, Robin, any uh, final questions or remarks, or are we just about out of time? No, I think we are at the five o'clock limit. This is a, this is the first time I think we've ever been on time for anything, Charlie. <laughs> okay. So uh, I just want to thank you all again for participating today, and uh, hopefully, if, if uh, I know some uh, of our people reached out to you individually if they had separate questions, but uh, hopefully, you all learned something and took something away, and uh, we want to thank you so much. Uh, for participating with us and we look forward to many more uh, conversations with you about how things have come out after COVID uh, has been resolved. So uh, we look forward to talking to you next year, uh, maybe from your yachts uh, uh, as, <laughs> as things get so much better. So take care. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks Appreciate for having it. us. Appreciate it. Bye y'all.